pray Lord now we believe we believe on the Son of God and through this we accept eternal life through him now we have gathered again this afternoon or this evening for another service trusting you for the message and for what you will tell us tonight we believe thee Lord and we wait upon thee. You said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle. And we pray, God, that you'll give us that mounting up power tonight as we wait on thee. We thank thee for these people and for what they mean to you and what they mean to me. I thank you for it, Father. They are your jewels. And I pray, God, that the night that you will manifest yourself and the way to them that they have need of, if there is sick here, may they be healed. If there's a doubt in someone's mind, clear it up, Lord. And just give us of thy presence and thy blessings because we need them, Lord. You are our all-sufficiency. And without you, we cannot do nothing. We pray that you will receive our thanksgiving for all that you have done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we look forward to your blessings. Amen. You may be seated. And well, it's just a, a bit cooler this Sunday night in here than it was last Sunday night. <laughs> but we are very grateful to our brothers who worked so faithfully and getting this in. I know two or three of them, Brother Mike Egan, as you see back there, and I, Brother Mike and Brother Southman, Brother, I believe, uh, uh, Roy Roberson and Brother Woods and all of them, they were down here just sweating it out, <laughs> trying to get it in so we could have this uh, message now or today. So we're grateful. Now, next Sunday morning, the Lord willing, I want to have a healing service of prayers for the sick. And we'll designate it to a healing service, if the Lord willing. I noticed this morning there's a bunch of handkerchiefs here. I prayed for them. And I, while you were praying and singing, I prayed for the handkerchiefs. And then there's more here tonight. So we, we believe that God heals the sick. So many great testimonies of healing among us. And across the world, and we're grateful for this. And I thought next Sunday being I have to be away for a little bit. And we've been holding so much just to the teaching and of the message. That I thought it would be a good thing if we had a, a, a healing service. Prayed for the sick. And we trust that God will give us a great time. Now many of you have to drive uh, many miles tonight. So I was talking to uh, groups over at the the Blue Boar Cafeteria today where I was having dinner. Many fine people, I got to shake their hands and talk with them. People I never met before that come here to the church. And I'm grateful for such friends. And I want to thank each and every one of you. Some of them have picked blackberries and brought us. And one brought us a bucket of syrup or molasses, I believe it was. And, and just thinking, you don't know what that means. And of a morning, I'd come up and go out of the house sometime. It was, the other morning, there was some brother there that was real bad off had no clothes and things for me go get him some clothes i started out and i almost stumbled over a bucket of blackberries sitting there and i said you bring these blackberries and he said no never had nothing to do with it i've been here for daylight and they were sitting here then and is my good brother ruddle had brought them to me and so those things i certainly appreciate billy paul just made mention to me a few moments ago that among this congregation tonight that took up an offering that for me I, I thank you for that I didn't want you to do that I, I just appreciate your efforts and so forth but that wasn't 
necessary. And But the Lord bless you. You know, you know the Bible said, In so much as you have done unto the least of these, you have did it unto me. Now, I've been kind of speaking to you on the message very straight. And uh, some people might be under the impression that that uh, I think that Jesus is going to come in the morning or tonight. I do. I, I don't say that He will. And again, He may not come for next week. It might be next year. It might be ten years. I don't know when He's coming. But there's one thing I want to always you bear in mind. You be ready every minute or hour. And that if He doesn't come today, He might be here tomorrow. So just keep that in your mind, that He's coming. And I don't know what time is going to be my last hour on this earth. Neither does any of us. And it's not of us know when He's coming. He doesn't even know Himself by His own words. He said the Father only knows when He will come. Not even the Son knows when He will come. It's when God sends Him to us again. But we're looking for His coming. And if He doesn't come in my generation, He might come in the next. If He doesn't come in that one, He'll come in the next. But for myself, I can't see hardly any time left. Uh, uh, I just, to me, it could happen at any minute. Now, that don't mean, that doesn't mean now that you'll see the heavens change and ever, that's not the coming I'm speaking of. I'm talking of the rapture. See, he makes three comings. He come in three sons' names. He come in a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. See, all of it the same Christ, the same God, all the time. Now we know he come to bring three works of grace, justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost. Everything in God is completed in threes. And so he come first to redeem his bride. He comes second as a rapture to take away his bride. He comes third with his bride, king and queen. After That's when many people are expecting the coming, but when he comes this time, Hardly none but those who are ready will know when he comes. There'll just be an absence of people. They won't know what happened to them. They'll just be caught away in a moment. And that they just come up missing, changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. So just be ready for that. It'd be horrible some morning to miss a loved one. No one can find him. Wouldn't it be too bad to know it's done past and you missed it? So just keep before God. Now, Next week, the Lord willing, next Monday, oh, from week from this Monday, if God willing, I'm taking the family back out to Arizona where they go to school. And I'm, I'm coming back. Now, I don't go out there. I haven't any services to be out there in. I'm hardly ever in Arizona. I'm gone somewhere else. I take the wife out there uh, next Monday. I'm coming back here again. I leave from here to British Columbia. I come back to Colorado. I'll be in Arizona again sometime near Christmas. Just for a few minutes, long enough, for maybe two or three days, get the family together, be back here through Christmas holidays. The Lord willing, have a service through New Year's week here. So then, uh, I'm here, practically, I'm here ten times more than out there because we don't have any church or any services out there. Nothing we have out there. So, uh, in a way of church service. That's one bad thing about it. I have no place to send the children that will hear these messages like your children get to hear it here. And, and so that's one defect we have. But they're all healthier. It's a dry, hot, dry climate. But all the children seem to be healthier. I'm not there long enough to know where it's healthy or not healthy. <laughs> I'm on the move and I, uh, I guess I was just born a rammer. <laughs> My wife calls me. I know she's here, so I'll get this after church. You all know. <laughs> what is that called? Shifting winds or restless winds or whatever. Whatever, you know, shifting sands. Or I'm always on the move, in other words. And I've been married now 22 years. And I, sometimes I think I'm a stranger around the house because I have to be going. But I'm looking for the time that when we'll be settled down in the homeland someday. But now the battle's on. So let's be in prayer. Don't forget, next Sunday morning, the Lord willing, bring in your sick and the afflicted. Come early. Get your place and probably as a group to be prayed for. We'll have to give out prayer cards. If there isn't enough, we won't give out prayer cards. Just enough to form a little line like two or three dozen or something. 
But we, uh, we'll probably give out prayer cards, so we'll probably do it about an hour before the regular service, which I think takes up. It'd be 8, 8 or 8.30. They'll give out the prayer cards, open the church, give the prayer cards next Sunday morning. And then be sure to be here for your, bring your loved ones, put them in there. It'd be nice and cool in the church if they're sick, and we'll do everything we can to pray for them. Thank you again for the love offering. And now we're going to read some of God's Word tonight and be ready for uh, this uh, event of His presence again to bring us His Word. Now we know we can read a text, but God has to reveal the context. See? We can take a text, but God has to reveal the context. While you're turning now in the book of Jeremiah, the second chapter, I want to say that I'm glad uh, I have with us Brother Lee Vale, a precious brother in the Lord. And I think your uh, brother here, I can't think of his name, um, <laughs> Brother Willard Grace. And I've seen the brothers from Arkansas, Brother John and them from around Poplar Bluff and Brother Blair. And oh, Brother Jackson, Brother Ruddle. And so many that I, I just can't, I wish I could call everybody's name, but I just can't do it. And you understand, Brother Ben, Brian, I see him sitting here. He's usually my amen corner. Well, I'm, everybody knows Ben by his voice. We, sitting in California one time, I was preaching a message for the Baptist people up in the valley. We had a big tent there and a lot of st- kind of aristocratic old Baptists. I could never hear a... Amen from anywhere, you know, afraid some of the women break the paint on their face. And then, first thing you know, I seen a pair of feet about like that go up in the air, and two big hands and a black hair shaking their horn. Amen. Screaming like that. I looked down and I said, Ben, where did you come from? <laughs> he's really getting the amen. I see his wife looking him over a little bit. <laughs> well, he's losing a little of that black hair, but that's all right. <laughs> Don't get worried about that. <laughs> I did mine a long time ago. So now, don't forget to pray. Now, while we get to the sincere side of the service, remember, if we read this word, then God will bless His word. It will not return to Him void, but it will accomplish that which is purpose for. And I know in reading the word, I'll always be right when I read the word. God will honor His Word. Now let us stand in respect to His Word. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the twelfth and thirteenth verses of Jeremiah 2. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot, can hold no water. Let us bow our heads now. Dear God, thy word has been read, and we pray that you will honor that word. And... Give to us tonight the parable or the parallel of it. As we look to uh, days gone by, Israel as examples, as the Bible teaches us, that we can see what you did to them when they obeyed the word, see what you did to them when they disobeyed the word, and learn what we must do. So we pray that you will speak to us tonight in a very special way that we might know how to conduct ourselves in this day that we learned this morning that we're living in. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. I want to speak tonight on the subject for just a, a short time on broken cisterns. Uh, Israel had done two great evils, God said. They had turned from Him, the fountain of life, and had hewed themselves cisterns to drink out of. 
Now, that's something, the reason I thought of this text was because that it would run parallel to what I was saying this morning of the hour that we're living and the cause that we are struggling for. And we look at Israel as example that what God was, He always has to remain the same. And there's only one thing that God ever did honor. That was His way that He provided for the people. And when they got out of that way, then God was dishonored and God made the people suffer for getting away from what He had told them to do. No matter what it was. He even gave them a law. Touch not, handle not, taste not. Just not because of the evil of doing it, but the evil of disobeying what He said do. And there's always cannot be a law without a punishment for law, because if there's no punishment, then law is not much to it, unless it has a penalty, the law. Now, we find what they did in that day seems to parallel what we are doing today, what the church people are doing. Now, we see a strange thing here. It might be strange to some people. When he said, you have, they have hewn to themselves cisterns, broken cisterns. Now, maybe some of you don't know what a cistern is. How many knows what a cistern is? Well, most all of you. If you was ever raised on a farm, you know what a cistern is. I remember I drank enough bugs from one to, to know what a, a cistern was. Preached out in a country where you, in a brush harbor where you'd have a, a big pitcher full of cistern water sitting there out of the, the rain, you know, and it kind of got a little old, and, and then the bugs at nighttime would get into it. And so I know what cistern water is. A, a cistern is a, a place, a thing that's dug in the ground uh, to take the place it, of a well. Uh, where people doesn't have a well, then they get a, a cistern. In other words, a cistern is a man-made tank or a man-made well uh, in the ground. That man dig out uh, to uh, catch the water, to, to use it. Some of them use it for wash water and some use it for drinking water and different way. Maybe all the water sometime that we used to get was on a cistern. Used to have an old uh, thing that had to wind around, 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 around to get the water up. Had little buckets on it to pump the water out of the cistern. Well, we notice one thing about a cistern. It's different from a well. Now, a cistern will get empty. Uh, the, the, the cistern cannot fill itself. It is, it is it's not reliable. You can't rely upon a cistern. It has to rely and depend upon the rains that fall in the summer or in the winter, whatever it is, to, usually in the winter time. When the snow and rain comes, then it runs the water off into the cistern. And if it doesn't get that water, then you, you don't have any water. It's all, it's all dries up. And it can't refill itself. The old cistern cannot re refill itself. It gets its filling from the, the rains it falls. And I want you to notice another thing about a cistern. Usually, you find, or the way it was at our place, a cistern, usually the barn's about twice the size of the house, and they usually run the water off the barn to the cistern. I remember that old cistern well out there when, he had, when the, the drain pipes rushed it into off the barn. It fills from the barn, so then the water is carried from the roof of the barn where all the animals stepping around through the stable yard and um, all the filth of the barnyard settles on top of the barn in dry times. And then the water comes and washes it all down off the roof into a trough. It's man-made, then into a man-made spout, and then into a man-made cistern. If you haven't got a mess, I don't know what you got when you got a cistern. Yes, sir. It's all man-made and just as dirty as it can be. Uh, you know, we used to call, we had a filter rag on one. Did you ever know what that was? 
had to put a filter rag on it to catch all the bugs and things that come off the top of the, the barn and all around the place and pour it out from one place to the other into the cistern. And we used to put a, a filter rag on it to catch all the, the scum and stuff that we could. Of course, that wouldn't catch the real dirt. It just caught the big missiles that come down and <laughs> fell into it. Uh, the bug might fall in it, but the juice of the bug went on with the water. So you, know, you really had a mess when you had an old dirty cistern. <laughs> in a few days, you let that water stand there, and it becomes stagnated. You let the water stand the cistern, it becomes stagnated. And it gets full of, of frogs and lizards and snakes, and we used to call it wiggle tails. Little bitty, I don't know where they're, not a parasite, they're uh, I don't know what you call them, but some little thing gets in the water that uh, we call it wiggle tails. You know what it is. How many knows what I'm talking about? Well, I'm sure all you country folks know. Um, gets it all full of stagnation. And then these lovers of stagnation comes with it. It just actually comes because it's stagnated. And because it's stagnated, it draws the animal there that likes stagnated things. That's a whole lot like our churches today. I think that we have left one of the great sins that the church has done today, just like Israel then. It left him the fountain of living water and has hewed themselves out man-made cisterns. And it become a habitation of everything that loves that kind of water. Lizards, frogs, and all kinds of unclean germs live in it because it's a man-made tank. And in this tank, these things stay. A perfect example of our denominational today. Now you say, Brother Branham, why do you strike at those people so hard? It ought to be struck at. It's got to be struck at. Flee it, because it will finally form the mark of the beast. Amen. Remember, that is the truth. Yes. It will be the mark of the beast. Denomination will lead right to it. It's on its road right there now to force by power. Look in the old Roman Empire. That's exactly what led them to that mark of an apostasy. You found out that no man could buy or sell without the mark of the beast. He had to have it. There's only two classes of people be on the earth. Those with the seal of God and those with the mark of the beast. Only two classes. So you'll have to have one or the other. It'll be an apostasy. A, a mark of, of religion. Apostate religion. And it's going to have an image unto the beast. And as we study, we find out that Rome was, is, and always will be the ma of the beast. Exactly. There's no way to get anything else. Rome. And what did Rome do was converted from pagan Rome onto papal Rome and organized the system, a universal system that forced everybody to that one religion or be put to death. And it's a strange thing that this United States appears on the scene and it's uh, like a lamb and a lamb has two small horns civil and ecclesiastical rights and after a while when that was a lamb we found out that it spoke then like a dragon and exercised all the power the dragon had before it and the Bible tells us that they said let us make an image unto the beast an image is something like something else. And we can see it right now that in its apostate condition, the church is forming the world council of churches, which is the image to the power of Rome and will force upon the people the same thing that pagan Rome did or papal Rome did. Amen. So there's no other way, no other thing, but that is the truth. That's why I'm striking it in my age, in my time. Because it's got to be struck at. The call coming to come out of her, my people. That you be not partakers of her sins. Now, I'm liking that to these dirty, filthy cisterns. He is the fountain of life. 
He is the living waters. And man leave that and dig for themselves cisterns, which can only catch the filth. That's the only thing it can catch. And that's what denominationalism does. It catches everything that comes along. It wants to join. They're willing to take it in if it's got some money. Or can dress in a certain way. No matter who they are, where they come from, they take them anyhow. Now we find again that this mark of the beast that was formed here, America is number 13. It was born with 13 colonies. It had a flag, it had 13 stars, 13 stripes. And it even appears in Revelations, the 13th chapter. And America has always been a woman, represented on our coins. Even the Indian head on a penny is a woman's profile. We know that, know the history of it. Everything, the Liberty Bell and everything out, the Liberty, Statue of Liberty is everything a woman. A woman number 13. See? Now, it's, it's beautiful to see those things. And now, I have predicted by a revelation from God or a vision in 1933 that seven things would happen before the end time. And at one of them, that Mussolini, who was then becoming dictator, he would become dictator and also you'd make an invasion and go down to Ethiopia and would take Ethiopia. In the spirit it said, he shall fall at his step. I wonder if these any the old timers still left in a tabernacle. Remember me saying that in the Redmond's Hall down here when we were preached many, many years ago. Is there one in the building tonight that's left from down there from the old Redmond's Hall when I preached that? When they had the NRA out way back in time of Roosevelt's first term. I guess there's not a one in here. Uh, is there one? Yeah, yeah, one. There's one. Yes, Miss Wilson. I remember her. My wife sitting in the back. Two left out of the old generation of those. In that day, that when they said this NRA was the mark of the beast, I said, nothing to it. Not at all. The mark of the beast don't come here. It comes out of Rome. And it can't be the mark of the beast. And I remember that these things are said said Adolf Hitler would come to a mysterious end and he would declare war on the United States and they'd build a great, a, a great concrete uh, thing that they'd even live in it. And right there, the Americans would take a horrible beating at this and it was a Siegfried line 11 years before it was ever started to be built. And then said, but he would come to an end and the states would win the war. And then said that there's three isms, Nazism, Fascism, and Communism. And I said they'll all wind up in Communism. Russia will take it all in Communism. And I said then, science is going to be so great, man's going to get so smart till he invents so many things, until he's going to make an automobile that looks like an egg. It'll have something like a glass top on it. And it'd be controlled by some other power than a steering wheel. And they've got the car. And I said, then the morals of our women is going to fall in such a degraded thing to go be a disgrace to all nations. They're going to wear man's clothes. They're going to keep taking off their clothes till actually they come down like they got their underneath clothes on. That's all. And finally, they'll come to wearing just a fig leaf. And if you notice in last month's Life magazine, they had the woman with the fig leaves on. And that's the new uh, evening frock or gown, what they wear of the evening. Transparent, can see through it. Only the fig leaves just hides a certain spot of her body. With strapless or strap, uh, unstrapped bathing suits, the top of it, exposed body. And how at those things has happened... Then I said, I seen a woman standing in the United States like a great queen or something. And she was beautiful to look at, but wicked in her heart. And she made the nation step, go to her step. But I said, finally, he told me, look back east again. And what I did, I seen, looked like as it was the world had exploded. As far as I could see was nothing but sticks and, and smoldering rocks have been blown up out of the earth. 
And these were to happen before the end of the world. And five of the seven has already happened in 33 years. There we are. Back to the end time. And I spoke against that denominational system right then. And I still believe tonight that it's a cesspool. That it's a place where the filth run into it. I can't believe that God would ever take such a thing in His church because it's got to be born of the Spirit of God and it cleansed before it can be called His. The mystical body of Christ, we are baptized into it by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes, this cistern system is certainly a perfect example of denomination. A wise man or to look and never to go into it, for God has proved through the ages that He's against it and never did work with it. Any group, any time a man raised up with a message, like Luther, Wesley, or so forth, and Smith and Calvin and them, when they started the organization, God laid the thing on the shelf and never did visit it again in a revival. Look through history. There has never been a time that God ever took a denomination and made a revival out of it. Nowhere. Then through history and by the Bible proves that it's a filthy thing in the sight of God. So I don't want nothing to do with it. And that's why I'm against and trying to get the people out of it. We are invited, like in Israel, so is it now, to look to Israel for examples they as long as they stayed with that fountain they were all right but when they got to hewing themselves cisterns man-made systems then god left them flat he'll do us the same they have forsook him the fountain of living water that was the complaints that god had against them to make something they they could say you see what we have done now when in the time of uh, the, the travel of Moses, when God by grace had given them a prophet, had given them a pillar of fire to go before them, had vindicated it by signs and wonders, grace had provided all these things, Israel still wanted saw law. They refused grace to take law. That's exactly what the people does today. They refuse the word to take a denominational system. Because in that they can do what they want to and get by with it. But you can't do it in Christ. You've got to come clean and clear in order to be in Christ. Leaving the artesian well for a man-made system or cistern. Could you imagine someone doing that? Could you imagine the mental conditions of a person? that could drink at a fresh artesian well and would leave that for a man-made cistern with frogs and lizards and wiggle tails and everything else in it. It don't seem even sensibly to be right. But that's just exactly what the people has done. They've left the Word, the true fountain of God's source and power to drink out of cisterns and make themselves cisterns. Same as they did then, they have done it now. He, say, he said, they've left me here. He said, here in Jeremiah 2 and uh, 14 or 13, rather. He said, they have left me, the fountain of living water. Amen. Now, we see what a cistern is. We see what it catches. We see how it's made. It's a man-made thing. It comes off of a dirty roof. The water that falls down. Hits on a dirty roof and it only washes the roof off. Puts it down through a man-made trough, through a man-made spout into a man-made tank. Amen. And all the filth gathers in there and the, the germs and the lizards and frogs and things of the land like that. Yeah. And notice they are the unclean animal. Amen. Wiggle tail stagnated. A wiggle tail can't live in clear water. If it does, it kill him. He's got to be in the stagnation. And that's the way it is with a lot of these uh, parasites today. You can't live in the fresh water of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason they're so firmly against the Word. 
and say it contradicts itself, there's nothing to it. It's because they have to have some kind of a stagnated pool to wiggle in. Right? That's the same way it is with frogs and with lizards and with tadpoles and such as that. They've got to get around the swamp or the stagnated pool to live. For it's their nature to live there. And you can't change the animal till you change its nature. And you cannot make a man see the Word of God till his nature's been changed. And when his nature is changed from what he is to a son of God, and the Holy Spirit comes into him, the Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God. Today I was talking with my good friend, Dr. Lee Vail, who's present now. And he's a, quite a theologian. And so we usually have some have some pretty good discussions on the Scripture. Very smart. And he asked me one time what I thought about the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. Was it speaking in tongues? It's been many years ago. I said, no. Can't see that. He said, neither do I. I said, though I've been taught that. He said, what would you think would be an evidence? I said, the most perfect evidence I can think of is love. And so we got to talking on that. And then I thought that sounded pretty good, so just help that if a man's got love. But one day the Lord, in a vision, straightened me out. And He said that the evidence of the Spirit was those who could receive the Word. Amen. Neither love nor speaking in tongues, but receiving the Word. Hallelujah. And then Dr. Bale was saying to me that that is scriptural. He said, because in John 14, Jesus said, when He, the Holy Ghost, has come upon you, He will reveal these things to you that I've taught you and will show you things to come. So there is the genuine evidence of the Holy Ghost. He's never told me anything wrong yet. That it is. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is He who can believe the Word. If you can receive it. Because Jesus never said when the Holy Ghost has come, you'll speak with tongues. Amen. He never said the Holy Ghost come, you'll do any of those things. But He said, He will take these things of mine and show them to you. Amen. And will show you things that is to come. Amen. So there is the genuine evidence of the Holy Ghost according to Jesus Himself. Amen. So all these sensations and things that people have and still live on, you can see why they do it. See, it becomes a denomination or stagnated pool. And there will never be a denomination made upon the, imp the perfect Word of God. It can't do it because you can't nominate or denominate God. Amen. No, sir. The reason is you get a bunch of men who can believe the Word. Let them start an organization. The first thing you know, in a year's time, there's a bunch of Rickies in there that you couldn't do nothing with. they got a hole and you can't do nothing about it. It's not God's system. It isn't. So we know that that thing's out and becomes a cistern. And it becomes a place where each one will compromise on this, that, or the other to get members in there. Or let people come in. We find out this system started one time back in the Israelite days when they was digging these cisterns. And there was a man and a bunch of Pharisees who had dug some cisterns. And they had a man named Herod. And he was a proclamator, governor of the state. And he come down to hear a man that didn't fool with their denominations. He was a prophet. And no prophet ever had anything to do with the denomination but hated it. Amen. This prophet began to say, Don't you begin to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father because I tell you that God's able these stones to rise children of Abraham. Amen. And they brought out a dignitary to hear him. And this dignitary had took his brother's wife away from him and married her. What did that man walk out to his face and say? They thought he would compromise and say, Now, sir, you, you have your nice seat over here. And you already, I'm so glad you're here to hear me today. John walked right up in his face and said, It's not lawful for you to have her. Amen. The very first thing he said, he bawled him out for his sin. Amen. See, denominations make stagnant pools. Where men can live with women and then women can carry on and cut their hair and wear shorts and anything else and call themselves Christians. But a genuine fountain, hallelujah, of the power of God, it can't stay there because it pushes it out. 
I am the fountain of living waters. They left me to dig themselves some cisterns. Now a fountain of living water. We find out what is a fountain of living water. We find out what the cistern is. Now what is a fountain of living water? It's an artesian well. An artesian well, what's that, Brother Branham? It's a well that uh, it's, uh, always comes from beneath and pushes its water out. It's flowing all the time. It is self-supporting, always fresh and clean. An artesian well, a fountain of living water. It's not dead and stagnated, it's living. It's constantly changing, bringing up something new all the time. <laughs> Moving on. Coming from its resources. It draws its resources from, from its bed, which is a, still a fountain of living water spraying up. Self-cleansing. It's clean, pure, clean water. It's self-supporting. You don't have to wait for the rains to fill its tank up. <laughs> it's always a bubbling up. Gives its water free. You don't have to... Pump it, wind it, twist it, or join it. <laughs> it's just a fountain of living waters. You know, you take these old cisterns, you have to crank it and crank it and crank it and pump them and everything to get a little less stagnated water out. <laughs> but a fountain of living water gives it out free without pumping, joining anything else. Oh, I'm glad for that fountain. Yes, sir. It needs no strainer on it to take the parasites out. <laughs> For it's coming so deep down there in the rock until there's no parasites there. It don't have to have an educational rag hanging on it. <laughs> That's right. Some whirly made system of man-made denominational wisdom to tell you before a psychiatrist whether you're able to preach or not. It don't have one of those filthy rags hanging on it. <laughs> it push it right off as soon as you put it on there. Amen. You can't do it. That well is bubbling up all the time. You put one of them rags on it, throw it from out of the one side or the other. It don't have no time for a denominational rag on it. <laughs> you don't need no filter, no strainer, no pumping, no jerking, no nothing else. It's just there bubbling up. Amen. <laughs> It don't have to depend on local rains to fill it up. Rains are revivals. <laughs> where that fountain, that's at that fountain of life, where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. Amen. You don't have to pump up a revival. You don't have to pump up nothing. Only thing you have to do is just come to the fountain. Amen. It's always full of good fresh water, and there's no end to it. It just keeps on bubbling. You don't have to go to the sister and say, well, if it rains and washes off the barn, we'll have something to drink. <laughs> my, my. Not this. That artesian well spurting forth good cold water all the time. You can depend on it. You don't have to say, well, I'll go to this old cistern we used to drink out of, but it hasn't rained in a long time. I'll tell you, it may be dry. That's the way some of these man-made systems are. You can go in if you got a big something going on, a big kaboo or selling something or, or some kind of a, something going on, a big parties and things going on, bunco games and parties in the basement and everything, you might find a full house. But where you go to where that fountain is bubbling up, always the people there are getting a good cold drink of water. You can depend on it. Amen. Say they haven't had a revival for 10 years. If you live with that fountain, she's always got a revival going on. Amen. Like the little Welshman said uh, one time when they had the Welsh revival going on, there's some dignitaries from the States. Some of these great doctors of divinity went over to Wales to find out where and what all this was about. So they had on their turnaround collars and their plug hats and they're walking down the street and here come a little cop along, whirling his little billy club in his hand, uh, whistling down at the cross where my Savior died, down there for cleansing from sin, I cried, there to my heart was a blood applied glory to His name, walking down the street. So they said, this seems to be a religious man, we'll go ask him. And they said, Mister, said, yes, sir. He said, we are here from the United States. We're a delegation. 
We come over here to investigate the Welsh revival, so-called. We are doctors of divinity, and we are here to look it over. He said, we want to know where the revival is and where it's held. He said, sir, you have arrived. <laughs> I am the Welsh revival. <laughs> the Welsh revival is in me. Here's where it's at. That's the way it is when you live by that fountain of living waters. It's living all the time, bubbling over and over and over and over. There's no end to it. Now go sift some water. We had a rain here not long ago. That's not it. It's that fountain of living water. As I say, it gives us water free. You don't have to put rags on it to find out some educational rags for you. Send him out to preach and see if he spells his words right, speaks them right. If he uses his nouns and pronouns and so forth and adjectives. Many of them don't even know what they are. But he's living at the fountain just the same. So you just say, it don't have to depend on the local rains to fill it up or the local revivals. For it, you don't have to do that. For its power and its purity is within itself. That's where the Word is. Its own power. When a man can receive it in his heart, it's got its purity. It's got its power. It's right in the Word itself. Springs forth to life. Israel would get away from it. They'd get in trouble. Every time they got away from it, they got in trouble. The same as we do now. When the revival gets away from that, then it's no good. It digs itself some wells and, or some stagnated cisterns, and there it goes. But he always helped them. The murmuring at the Red Sea. Then, when they murmured, yet in all that he had promised, made them a promise, he should have turned them back right there the way we'd look at it. But he had promised to take them over there. What did he do? Them children of Israel, he furnished them the pillar of fire and everything for vindication, their prophet. And they led him out there to the sea and always his trouble against it. And here come the Pharaoh and his army. And you know what God did? He just opened up that red stagnated cistern. The dead sea is the deadest thing in the world. It's really dead. It's stagnated. Nothing can live in it. And he opened it up and set them free on the other side. He took them to where they wouldn't have to be bound by such a thing as that. In the wilderness, they found that the tanks could not be depended on. They were dry. Found out they go from one water hole to another. When they was in the wilderness, they're starving to death for a drink of water. And they go to this tank over here. A pond. It is dried up. They went to another place. It was dried up. They just couldn't think they was ever going to get a drink. And then on the most unlikely place in all the desert, they found the water. It was in a rock. It was in a rock. The most unlikely place that a man would find any water would be in a dry rock in the middle of a desert. But you see, God does things like that. In the most unlikely place, in the most unusual way. That's what we've always had. They think you have to have a big denomination so together and let them all come together and have a great big milling around and so forth and get thousands to cooperate and all like this to have a revival. Sometimes God takes the little old guy, I don't even know his ABCs. And right amongst a bunch of illiterate people that hardly know his right hand from the left, he can raise up a revival that will shake the world. He did it in the time of John. He had done it in the time of the prophets. None of them, as we know of, was ever educated. But God could get a hold of them and do something with them. In this rock came forth the waters. He was the rock. And He commanded this rock and must be smoked. And He gave abundance of pure, fresh, clean water to everybody that would drink. He saved all who would drink from it. A perfect parallel, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. God smote that rock on Calvary. Our judgment is upon Him, that from Him might come the Spirit of life that would give you and me eternal life. That's a perfect parable of it there in this wilderness. They never had to pull, dig, pump, or anything, just partake of His provided way freely. When they didn't have to dig it out of a pond, they didn't have to pull it up with a bucket, 
They didn't have to have no window to get it with. They just had to partake of it. And that's all there is now. You don't have to join nothing. You don't have to get out the altar and work up something, pump in it. You don't have to say a word over and over and over until you get a confusion of language. The only thing you have to do is just partake of Him for you. God's provided way. No pumping, no pushing, no nothing. Just take of it freely. Nothing you have to do, just partake of it. That is just believe it. That's all I can say to it. They never had to do anything for it. Never had to dig for it. They never had to get down and cry all night for it. They just partook of it. It was smitten and ready. That's right. I'm looking at a man now, sitting in the back of the room here. I remember telling that on an old barn stall one day by a manger. And he said, but I'm no good. I said, I know you're not. And I said, I'm not either. But I said, you're looking at what you are. Quit looking at what you are and look what he is. He said, if I could just get rid of these cigarettes, Brother Branham, I, I, I'd be a Christian. I said, don't get rid of them. You're trying to get good and then come to him. He never come to save good men. He come to save bad men and know they were bad. He said, well, I said, listen, you don't want to go to hell, do you? He said, no. I said, well, you don't have to. He died that you might not have to go. He said, what do I have to do? I said, nothing. It's just that simple. He said, but if I could ever... I said, there you go back to that cigarette again. Quit thinking about that cigarette. Just remember, think about Him. What He did, what He is. Not what you are, you're no good, and you never was, never will be. But what He is. He's the one. And I said, now the only one thing you have to do, if He took your place down there, you just willingly accept what He did. The only thing you have to do is just accept it. Well, I said, that's simple, I'll do that. I said, here's the creek. I brought him up here and baptized him in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some of these people are sitting here, and I, I know uh, they felt funny at me for doing that. But I know what I was doing. I seen in the man something that was genuine. I could see it there, and I took him and baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when we did that, it wasn't long after that, just one down to his son's house, we seen a, a vision of a tree being broke at a certain place. And the man fell, almost broke his back, took him in the hospital, and that night the Lord revealed to me that was the end of cigarettes. So the next day he wanted some cigarettes. I said, I'll buy him a carton and take it to him. <laughs> you just watch and see. His cigarette days are done. He's never smoked one since, never wanted one since. God, see, the first thing you've got to do is to come to that fountain. You've got to come to that water. Realize it's nothing that you can do. It's what He done for you. You don't have to dig. You don't have to pump out. You don't have to quit this. You don't have to quit that. The only thing you have to do is get there and drink. That's all if you're thirsty. Drink. Now, He was the rock. God smote Him for us. And He gave forth abundance of pure, clean water. He does yet today to everyone that will Amen. believe. This is His grace, of course, to His people, us. They something like there, like the people of today, ready to receive what they can get, but don't want to give any service in return. Israel was ready to, to drink from the rock now, but they didn't want to give God His service that was doing. And He's always given us a service. You know, we can't even breathe without Him. We can't breathe without God's service. That's how dependent we are on Him. And yet, it almost breaks us in two if we try to do, have to do something for Him. He asks us to do something. Go see somebody. Go pray for somebody. Go help somebody. It almost breaks us up to do it. But we don't want to do anything to Him for service. His complaint was, they have forsaken me, the Word, and have accepted a broken cistern instead. Except they have forsaken me, the fountain of life the fountain of water, of life, and they desire and would rather drink from a stagnated cistern. Could you imagine that? 
Could you imagine a person now that here's an artesian well is putting out that fine limestone water right out of the heart of the rocks down there in the sand beds and so forth, just as cold and good as it could be, and would rather drink out of a cistern over there that had washed off the top of the barn, the sheds, and all the outbuildings around the place and put it right into that cistern there where the seepage of the water drains right back into from the barn, the stables, the stalls, and everything draining right back into the cistern. And then we want to ex- well, drink out of that before or going to that artesian well, there would be something mentally wrong with the person. Amen. That's right. And when a man or a woman will take a denomination on their stand that will permit bobbed hair, wearing shorts, makeup, all this other kind of stuff, and some little kind of a, a program and all this carrying on and can go to the bowling alleys and, and all that nonsense out there and can put up with that and like that better than to do the old-fashioned Word of God that cuts down and hews out and makes ladies out of women and takes them, makes them dress right and act right, takes cigarettes and tobaccos and swearing and cursing and lying and stealing away from you and all the world away from you and give you something that has a perfect satisfaction. Why do a man or woman go to such a thing as that for comfort? How can you get comfort out of that? How could you get a fresh drink out of a stagnated cistern? Why would a person, if a person goes to a stagnated cistern to get a drink when there's an artesian well open, you'd say there's something wrong with that man's mind. And if a woman or a man goes to such a place to find comfort, there's something spiritually wrong with that person. They don't want the Word. It shows that their nature is still a frog or a tadpole or something. That's right. Something of that nature that likes that stagnated pool. Because them kind of things won't live in a freshwater pool. They can't do it. It's freshwater. They can't do it. Now, the complaint was they left it. And today, they've done the same thing. Now, look at the woman at the well. Well, she'd come up to Jacob's cistern. And she had been getting water there all the time at Jacob's cistern. But... Jacob's uh, sister in denomination, we would call it, because he dug three of them. And this one he had dug. Now, she had a great story. She said, now, our father dug this well, Jacob. He drank out of it. His cattle drank out of it. And everything isn't that good enough. He said, but the water that you draw from there, you thirst again. Have come back here to get it. But said, the water that I give you is a fountain, a geyser, spurting up from the inside. And you don't come here to get it. It's right with you. Notice. But when she discovered that a scriptural fountain had spoken to her by a scriptural sign that she had been looking for, she left that Jacob's denominational system and never went back to it again because she had found the real rock. She ran into the city. She was through with sin. She was no more a foul woman. She said, come see who I have found. A man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Christ? That cistern might have been all right. It had served its purpose. Now, she was at the true fountain. The cistern had been all right until the true fountain was open. But when the true fountain came along, the cistern lost its strength. She found there's a better place to drink. And there is a better place. There's a better place than that's in Christ. In St. John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus said at the last of the Feast of the Tabernacles, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. They were all rejoicing. They had a little spurt of water coming out from under the altar. And, and there they was all drinking from this in celebration the, of the feast. And said, Our fathers drank from a spiritual rock in the water sea. They had hewed themselves a cistern. Some stagnated water that pumped down from somewhere and spurted it up under the temple there. And they would all get around this water and drink and say, Years ago our fathers drank in the wilderness. Jesus said, I am that rock that was in the wilderness. Amen. Said, We eat manna from heaven and God rained it down. Said, I am that manna. Yeah, that fountain was standing among them. That bread of life was standing among them. And still they did not want it. They'd rather have their cistern. Because man had made this and God had sent that. That's exactly the difference. Dug themselves sisters. 
He said, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He is that fountain. And as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, he is that artesian well. Out of his belly or innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. He is that rock that was in, it was Hagar's rock in the time of trouble when her baby was about to die, when she'd been put out of the camp and was out there with a little Ishmael. Her water and her sister that she was packing with her had give out. And she laid little Ishmael down and walked over a bow shot and cried and walked because she didn't want to see the baby die. And all at once the angel of the Lord spoke and she found Bera Barsheba, the, the well there that was flowing is still flowing to this day. He was Hagar's Bera Barsheba rock out there in the wilderness. He was standing here in the fountain filled with blood that day, standing there in the temple. Uh, now, time of storm. In Zechariah 13, chapter, he was that fountain opened in the house of David for cleansing and for sin, cleansing of sin. He was that fountain. In the Psalms 36, 9, he was David's fountain of life. He's still that fountain in the house of David, and he's the poet's in his heart. There, poet said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins when sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. He is that fountain of life, Amen. fountain of water. He is the Word of God. People of these last days has forsook Him the true Word, water of life, and has hewed themselves out denominational systems. And again, hewed, dug, and now... We find out they have bro had broken cisterns. And then this cistern is filled with unbelieving germs, unbelieving, uh, boasting, educational programs, and so forth, which is contrary to God's promises. They're doubters of the Word. Now, these cisterns that they've got, the Bible said, were broken. Broken cistern is a leaking cistern. And it's seeping out. What's it doing? It's sleeping out into a religious cesspool called the World Council of Churches. And that's where the broken cistern is leading them to. All because they have forsook Him and have uh, the fountain of living water and made these cisterns. Digging out big seminary systems of learning, education, and so forth. That's the kind of systems they're digging today that a man has to have a Ph.D. or L.L.D. or a Bachelor of Art or something before he can even go preach. Sisters, that has been filled with man-made theology. They take them into these great big schools of learning. And in there they inject into them their own man-made theology. And they send them out with that. What a day that we're living in. Man-made sisters. No trouble. The, no wonder the thing has become a, a stink. Oh, my. It's because that the people drink from that. And when the people want joy today, what do they do? The people, instead of accepting the joy of the Lord, they turn to sin for joy. People who go to church and claim to be servants of Christ, when they get real nervous, they'll light up a cigarette. And when they, when they want to, to have some fun, they stick on their immoral clothes and go out and cut the grass when the man's going by and give him a whistle at him. They do everything to be popular. They want to look like the movie stars. That's their joy. When Jesus said, I am their sufficiency, the reason that they go to that because they don't want to drink from that fountain. They've turned it down. They don't want to drink from it. They join themselves to some kind of a man-made system. Some kind of a cistern is full of all kind of stagnated things that they can go like that. Yesterday, we had the kids up on the river, I believe it was Saturday morning. We went out and Billy had been fishing the boat. And we took the kiddies up, my little grandson and them, my daughter and my little son. And, uh, we went up the river to, to take a boat ride. You couldn't even take a boat ride on the river for the filthy, dirty, scummy people out there on the river, half naked and carried on. 
a boat drove up beside us, a bunch of little 12, 14 year old boys, each one with a beer can in their hand and a cigarette. They call that having fun. Oh my, how long can this world last for such a system as that? Then to free themselves from the thoughts that when they die, they'll go to hell. The thing they do, they go and join one of these man-made cisterns. So that same type of people belongs in that cistern. It's nothing but a bunch of unclean, filthy, wiggle tails of the world. And they associate themselves to that because, as my old mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. They won't come to the fountain and be cleaned up from that life of sin. They want to live out there and still hold a testimony that they are Christians. Why? They've turned from Him the true fountain of joy. Life. Perfect life and satisfaction. That's the reason they did it. Because that they want to join up. They have some kind of people there that believe in that stuff. Here not long ago, Brother Fred and I and Brother Tom, a bunch of us went to a, a noted Baptist church in the city of Tucson to see if we couldn't find a little something that would give us a, maybe a little fresh feeling. And the minister said something about the people in Egypt. When they left, they was eating garlic and so forth. They want to go back again and eat that. Said, that's something like people of today. And we everybody said, Amen. Uh, I never seen such a bunch. The whole church lost the sight of the preacher and looked back to see who it was that said, Amen. Like scared them to death. They didn't know what it was. When the David said, Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Praise Him upon hearts. Praise Him with the poultry. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord and praise ye the Lord. God rejoices in His people. Let them of the learn say amen when anything is said right. Why not turn from this system and cisterns of the world to the faithful system of God which is the artesian well, Jesus Christ. Why don't you turn to Him? Where God is our abundant supply of joy, our abundant supply and praises, our abundant supply and satisfaction. The calmness of my nerves comes from God. When I'm tore up, I find my satisfaction in Christ. Not in a cigarette. Not in the things of the world. Not in joining some creed. But in finding Him the promised Word that He said... If I go away, I'll come again to receive you. I find my joy in that. Uh, He is my joy. They say today, by joining these things and by making this world council of churches, that they're going to make a better place to live in. To my honest opinion, they're going to make a better place to sin in. (laughs) That's just the whole thing, sin anyhow. Not to live in, but to die in. (laughs) Make us a place to sin in instead of live in. Any other thing outside of Jesus Christ and His Word of life is a broken sister. Anything that tries to substitute it. Anything that you try to do to bring you peace. Anything that you try to do to bring you comfort. Any kind of a joy that you receive from anything else is a substitute for this. It's a broken sister full of filth. He gives perfect satisfaction. I remember here a couple summers ago I stepped out the back door. There's a young snickle fritz out there. It said to me, said, you know the reason you're always talking about women like that wearing those shorts and things? He said, because you're an old man. I said, that's the reason it is. I said, look here, how old are you? He said, 27. I said, when I was many years younger than you, I preached the same thing. I found a fountain of satisfaction. He is my potion. Amen. As long as he supplies that, that's the beauty. That's, that's, my, that's my art is looking at him. Watching his handwork and see what he's doing. There's no other fount I know. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood. Gone from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the blood. Lose all their guilty stain. I'm telling you, no other fountain I know but that fountain. It cleansed me when I was dirty. It keeps me clean because I want to live right at it. Drink this fresh water that fills my soul with joy. I can be so ever so down and feel that I can't hardly go no another round. Can't go nowhere else. Then I can kneel down and put my finger on a promise and say, Lord God, Thou art my strength. Thou art my satisfaction. Thou art my all in all. I can begin to feel something bubbling up for the inside of me there. I'll come out of it. 
As I pass 50 years old, I wake up of a morning, you know how it is, can't hardly get that one foot out of the bed. My, he can't hardly do it, and somebody at the door knocking, or Billy telling me to the emergency somewhere, I've got to go, and I think, how can I do, try to put one foot out? And I think, thou art the fountain filled with my strength. Amen. Amen. My strength and my help cometh from the Lord. Amen. Thou art my artesian well, Amen. thou art my youth. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord God, this is my duty to go. I'm called to the post of duty. And the first thing you know, something begins to gurgle up inside of me. The other day over to a little place I was having a meeting over here in Topeka, Kansas. There's a boy, a young preacher, one of my first sponsors, Brother Roy, sitting here and remembers the place in this in this great place there, there was a, uh, this minister had got under a roof or a place, a sidewall, mashed him down beneath that the little fellow was going to die. His liver was bursted. His spleen was knocked out of place. Tons fell on him. I sat at the breakfast talking to the wife. I said, wife, you know Jesus is here. You know what he'd do? I said, when he sponsored me, I believe that word he is sponsoring Christ. And I said, that's a trick of the devil. I said, if Jesus is here, he go lay his holy hands upon him. That boy get well. I don't care if his liver is bursting. he get well because Jesus would walk in there knowing exactly who he was. He knew his calling. The scriptures was right vindicating in him. He knew who he was. And not, a, not no shadow of doubt. He lay his hands upon him and say, son, be well. Walk out of there. And I said, there's enough devils in hell to kill that boy then. I said, he'd get well. But I said, you see, honey, he was Jesus the holy hands of God. I said, I'm a sinner. I was born sexual uh, um, birth. My father and mother were both sinners. And I'm just a no good nothing. And I said, but you know what? If the Lord would give me a vision and send me down there, then that would be different. I said, I'd go down and lay my hands on him. He'd come out of that bed if he gave me a vision. Then I got to thinking, after all, if it was the vision... What was it? It was the same dirty hands on him. Amen. Same man praying for him. Amen. Same dirty hands. Amen. Then I begin to think, I am his representative. Amen. Then God doesn't see me. That blood of that righteous one lays up there upon the altar. It makes intercessions for me. He's my sufficiency. He's my prayer. He's my life. Amen. I said the only thing that make me... Put my hands on him with faith because I have faith in the vision. Amen. And without the vision, the same faith to do the same thing. Amen. So I can reckon myself nothing but reckon him my all in all. He is my life. He is my commissioner. Amen. No denomination sent me. He sent me. Amen. Hallelujah. I go in his name. Amen. I lay hands up on him. Walk down there and lay hands on that boy. And that night he was in the meeting solid well. Amen. 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 Oh, yes. He's that fountain. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm a stinker. I'm a renegade. Every one of us are. But before God, we are perfect. You be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. How can you be because a perfect one represents us there? That fountain is there every day, fresh. Not some stagnated something, but fresh every day that washes away all my sins. He is that fountain. Now I close them. I say this. Anything different from this is broken sisters. And will finally leak out what you put in it. If you're putting all your hopes, all your time, and everything in one of those stagnated sisters, Jesus said they were broken sisters. God said they're broken and they'll leak out every what you put in them. You can't go any farther with them because they'll leak out. For He is the only way to the truth, to the life, and to eternal joy and eternal peace. He is the only one and the only way to that. Oh my, the inexhaustible fountain of life is Jesus Christ. Why? And who is He? The Word. The same. The Word, the life, the fountain, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The true believer, it's His supreme joy, His supreme life. And his supreme satisfaction is in Christ. No pumping, no pulling, no joining, no bailing. (laughs) Just believing and resting. That's what he is to the believing. Like Father Abraham, 
He never pulled. He never fretted. He never wearied. He had the Word. Amen. He laid upon El Shaddai's breast. When Abraham was a hundred years old, God appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty. The Hebrew word is El Shaddai. means the breasted one. And you're old and your strength is gone. But just lay upon my bosom and nurse your strength from this fountain. <laughs> Amen. What did he nurse himself to? A new body. He had the baby by Sarah and 50 years later had seven children by another woman. Oh, El Shaddai. The Old Testament shows what he did. The New Testament tells what he'll do. Amen. In the Old Testament. Now the air is off. So I'll hurry and quit here now, just a minute. i like to say this before close. I had a good example of this one time. I was patrolling. And many people here, down around Georgetown, down there in Milltown, there used to be way back in the hills a fountain. It was an artesian well. It was thrown out about a, a four or five foot stream of water, just gushed out all the time. And a great big fountain around there, and it, right around uh, was a lot of this here, penny roll, you know, and stuff growing there, that mint like. And oh, I used to just thirst to get there. Oh my, to get to that fountain. And I'd lay down with this thing and just drink and drink and sit down and drink, wait. And a year after year, I'd still come to this same fountain. It never did cease winter or summer. They couldn't freeze it. You can't freeze an artesian well. Oh no. Oh no. I don't care how, how cold it gets, it ain't going to freeze that. You'll freeze a sister and just a little frost will do that. See? But anything that's moving got life in it. It's a moving around. And you can't freeze the artesian well out. No matter how depressed the spirit is around the place, this well is always living. Live at that well. And I noticed there, I went by and I drank at it. And oh my, just the fresh water. You never had to worry. Wonder if I get there, wonder if it quit running. It's been running. The old farmer told me, said my grandfather drank out of it. And said it never has dimished or nothing. It's still the same well. Gershon right out into Blue River there. And I thought, oh my, what a fine place of water. I walked about a mile out of the way to get to that place because it was such a real place to drink at. Oh, how good that water was. Oh my. I, I get out there in that desert Arizona now. I still think about it. That wonderful well down there. If I could just lay down to that. As David said one time, oh, if I could once more drink from that well. Amen. If you just get there. And I sat down one day, and I had a little funny thing that happened to me. And I said, uh, what makes you so happy all the time? I wish I could be happy like that. Why, well, i never seen you sad since I've been coming here. There's not one sad thing about you. I said, you're always full of joy. You're jumping and bubbling and carrying on winter or summer, cold or hot, whatever it is. You're always full of joy. What makes you, what, what is it? Because I drink out of you? Nope. I say, well, maybe the rabbits drink out of it and you like it so well. Nope. I say, well, what makes you bubbling over like that? What makes you so happy? What makes you always full of joy? I say, is it because that, that the birds drink from it? No. Because I drink from it? No. I say, well, what makes you so full of joy? Now, if that well could speak back to me, he'd say this. Brother Branham, not because you drink, I appreciate that, and because I can furnish for the birds. I furnish for anybody that wants to drink. The only thing you have to do is come here and drink. But well, what makes me happy, it ain't me bubbling. It's something inside pushing me. It's something bubbling me. And that's the way it is with a Spirit-filled life. As Jesus said, He was in, He give you a wells of water springing up in the everlasting life. An artesian overflowing gusher that's constantly flowing. Whether the rest of the church is up or down, you're still in that well. Why would you take an old denominational system and cistern full of parasites and everything else and drink around all that stagnated stuff when you're invited to a fountain? An artesian well. I think how it just pushed and juggled and, and gurgled and laughed and joyed and jumped and frolic. Cold, rainy, hot, dry. When all the rest of the country was drying up, it was bubbling just like it always did. Because it was deep, rooted, Way down in the rocks it come forth. Yes. Oh, let me live with that, Gersher. Take all your man-made systems you want to, all your old stagnated wells, but let me come to, or stagnated cisterns, but let me come to this fountain. Let me come there where He is just full. He is my joy. 
He is my light. He's my, he is my strength. He's my water. He's my life. He's my healer. He's my savior. He's my king. Everything that I have need of is found in him. Why would I want to go to anything else? Brother, sister, won't you come to this fountain tonight? Won't you, if you're not ever been there, won't you receive it tonight while we bow our heads? Broken cisterns, leaking, seeping, the world seeping into it, filth from the barns and of other days. Why not this well that that stuff cannot stand? This great fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Why don't you receive that tonight? May God help us tonight in this dry, thirsty land. As the prophet said, He is the rock in a weary land. He's that fountain. Won't you come to Him tonight in your hearts while we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, there's no other fountain as the music is playing. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I was born there. I've been raised there. I want to live there and die there and rise again there in His presence. Always, Lord, let me be in His presence. For there's no other I know, no creed, no love, no love but Christ. No creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. No anything else. No joy outside of Him. Take Him from me. Oh, God. I don't care how much the world I own. It, it would still be dead. I'd wander around with my hands up over my hair. Take Him from me. I'll be gone, Lord. But let Him be in me. Then December's as pleasant as May. Then there's no hot places and no dry places. Even death itself has no victory. Let us have Him, Father. Give Him in abundance to every believer here tonight as they've waited in this room. Many of them's got to drive along the road tonight as they go to their homes and may this be their thinking. I'm living at that fountain. I'm living there, freshly drinking hour by hour. And if they haven't received that as yet, may they receive Him now. So they can take the fountain right with them. I'll go with you. I'll be with you to the end of the world. Grant these things, Father. And now while we have our heads bowed, is there someone in here tonight, or how many would say, Lord, take me to that fountain just now? I've never come here just to hear. I come here to find out something. I come here to find you, Lord. I have a need of you tonight. Come to my heart right now. Will you do it, Lord? God bless you. Lord, bless each one. Father, you've seen the hands, even up and around the wall and in the other rooms, outside, you, you've seen them, Father. I, I pray that you'll supply everything they have need of. Maybe they've been drinking in some old cistern, Lord, just some halfway stopover where some man hewed out a cistern has become contaminated with all kinds of strange doctrines, denying the word. I pray, God, that tonight they'll come to Him who is that fountain, that fountain of life. Granted, Father, I commit them to Thee now in Jesus' name. And You told me if you ask anything in my name, it'll be done. Now, I wouldn't ask this, Lord, if I didn't think it would be done. I'd be, I'd be just uh, saying it uh, in a ritual routine. But I pray for them with sincerity. I pray for them believing that you will grant what you promised. And now I take them away from that cistern tonight. I take them away from the place they've been drinking where they're not satisfied to this fountain. I do it in Jesus Christ's name. They're yours, Lord. Let them drink from you the living water, the fountain of living water. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Grant it, Lord. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other 
thou dies, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what can make me hold again? Oh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, heal these, Lord. Grant it, Lord, through Jesus' name. We pray, God, that you now know us all things. The blood of Jesus. Think of it. No other fountain, no. Amen. I don't know nothing else but Him. Amen. I don't desire to know nothing else but Him. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, oh, precious is that blow that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus. While we sing that again, let's shake hands with one another. Do you love one another? Yeah. Is there anybody in here got anything against somebody else? If there is, go make it right, will you? Let's not leave here like that. See, if you got an ought against anybody, you go make it right right now. Right now is your opportunity to go or say, Brother, sister, I said something about you. I thought something. I didn't mean to do that. Forgive me. See? That's the way to do it. Let's have the fountain right among us all the time. See? No other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no. No other fountain. We won't contaminate ourselves with other things. We have separated, left the world behind. We don't want no more of Egypt's garlics and broken cisterns. We're in the journey with the Lord Jesus, that smitten rock. Amen. Eating manna from above and drinking, eating angels' food and drinking from the rock. Amen. No other fountain. No. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let us bow our heads. Praying that God will so richly bless each of you. That His grace and mercy will be with you through the coming week. And if anything should happen, that one of you may slip beyond the veil now. Just remember that it's only a few hours of sleep and rest. Until we meet, remember that they which are alive and remain shall not hinder those which are sleeping. For the trump of God, that last trumpet, the sixth one has just sounded. And that last trumpet, like the last seal, will be the coming of the Lord. It shall sound in the dead and Christ shall rise first. Just resting till that time. And if you should get hurt, remember, take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. And when temptations around you gather, just breathe that holy name in prayer. Devils will flee. Just remember, we hope to meet you here next Sunday morning, bringing the sick and afflicted. I'll be praying for you. You pray for me now. Will you do it? Say amen. amen. I'll pray for you that God will bless. Name in prayer. Pray. name
of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him. Oh, when our journey is complete, precious name, precious name. Isn't it sweet and precious? Oh, Father, and joy of heaven, precious name, precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, how sweet, oh, Father, and joy of heaven. It's always so hard to leave you, <laughs> although I know you're burning up, but there's just something about that's one more verse of something. Will you do it? Will you do it? Blessed be the tie that binds, sister. How many knows the old song? We well, used to sing it years ago. Now I sing it tonight. Two hands out of the hundreds that's left. When we used to sing that song around the tabernacle and charm one another's hands. Blessed be the tie that binds. I've buried a lot of them right up here in the cemetery. They're waiting. I'll see them again. I see him once in a while in the vision. When I look beyond the veil, they're there. Let's bow our heads now as we sing. Bless me. somebody's hand their part I bow your head it give us in word pain but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to be again. with our heads bowed I turn the service to the pastor now.